All right, so photosynthesis, we, we did a, a pretty brief introduction of it last class. Um, the first part of 8.2 is just really getting into like, how does chlorophyll work, right? Chloroplasts, they have the, the main molecule that's like the solar panel is chlorophyll. So a little bit of how chlorophyll absorbs the sunlight. And then the light, the, there's two parts of, of photosynthesis, the light reactions and the dark reactions. So we'll do the light reactions today. And uh, it's actually pretty cool. It'll tie in a little bit with what you learned in cellular respiration with the electron transport chain. Um, so anyways, yeah, chloroplasts, think of them like these solar powered chemical factories. You're gonna take the energy from sunlight and use that energy to make a sugar. That's your goal. Um, where this is all happening is the thylakoids. So you have your chloroplast, and then inside the chloroplast, like if I just draw like, here's your chloroplast, you would then have these stack of poker chips where the whole stack, that's called the granum, or grana, grana being plural, granum singular, a chance I have that wrong, doesn't really matter that much. Each individual poker chip is a thylakoid. And then within that thylakoid, that's where we're doing the reactions of photosynthesis. And I'll have, I'll have a picture of the thylakoid here soon. Um, so inside the thylakoid, in the light reactions, we're gonna take that light energy, and our main purpose is just to make ATP and NADPH. We're not making the sugar in light reactions. What we're doing is we're making ATP and NADPH, and we're gonna use the energy from these molecules to then make, ultimately, your glucose. Okay, so light reaction is just kind of getting you those those uh, that energy source for now. All right, um, get my here. All right, so then uh, a little getting into like light. So um, you know, uh, this isn't a physics class, but remember, light can be a particle and a wave. It's a pretty wild, um, uh, not molecule, but um, electromagnetic. Uh, radiation is what it is, you know, pretty wild source of energy. Um, and it, and when we say it, 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 it can behave like a wave, there is something called the uh, electromagnetic spectrum, okay? Where there's something called the wavelength. So um, basically light, this is like a light as a wave. The wavelength would be the distance between like, say here and here, or like, the tops to tops, or like if I were to extend this down, it could be the distance from the bottom to like the bottom, right? That would be the wavelength, the length of one wave. So when light is at higher energy, these waves will get smaller. So like if I were to draw a higher energy um, a particle of light, it would look something like this. So it's, um, what I, I, I want you to know about that is there's an inverse relationship. Meaning, the shorter the wave, oh, they have it here, right here. The shorter the wavelength, the higher the energy. So it's a little bit backwards. But think about it like, um, you know, if it's going faster and faster and faster, that would indicate more and more energy to keep doing more and more waves. Think of like the ocean, right? The faster the waves are coming in, the more energy, you know, those waves would be having. Um, and then the opposite would be true. The longer the wavelength, the lower the energy of light. And it's important to understand that like, when we think of light, we think of visible light, but that's only a very small portion of light, of the electromagnetic spectrum. And it's also important to understand that like, radio waves, microwaves, like my microwave over there, those are all the same form of, uh, same kind of particles, it's just a photon. It's just, it's the same, it's just lower energy, right? Bigger, longer wavelengths, but lower energy. And then gamma rays, x-rays, UV light from the sun, it's all part of the same spectrum, same, same um, particle, but um, it's just higher energy, so smaller wavelength, okay? So visible light, that's where most of the action's happening for photosynthesis. And specifically, it's gonna be um, the, uh, it's kind of interesting because the parts of photosynthesis that work best are gonna be the, um, the higher and lower energy wavelengths of light or the shorter wavelengths and longer wavelengths. Or say differently, purplish, bluish, and reddish, and, and like the orange is green. And that should make sense to you because what color are plants? Green. green, right? So the greenish light, that's gonna get reflected back to us. That's the, that's the, the um, wavelength of light that isn't, that the chlorophyll molecules um, and molecules like them, they don't really absorb and, and utilize that wavelength of light, okay? 
So let me make sure I set everything on these slides. Wavelength distance between the crests. Um, crests would be like the top part of the wave. Anyways, all right. Um, yeah, visible light, 380 to 750 nanometers. I I'm not gonna like test you on that explicitly, but I do want you to know the colors, knowing which colors would work best. It's you know, purplish blue and then more of the reddish. Um, all right, so, so that's, that's, you know, I said light can be a particle in a wave. That's like the wave nature of light. But then light also behaves like these kind of discrete particles that we call photons. And each photon we say is a fixed quanti quantity of energy, uh, inversely proportional to the wavelength of light. What I was saying earlier, the, the shorter the wavelength, the higher the energy. Hot, the longer the wavelength, the lower the energy. Okay. Um, all right. So pigments. Chlorophyll is an example of a pigment. A pigment is just anything that can absorb that visible light. And so within that, uh, within the chloroplast, within the, the thylakoid of the chloroplast, you'll have different kinds of pigments. And I'll, I'll show you some of the different pigments. And each pigment's gonna absorb light at different wavelengths. Okay. Um, and then wavelengths that are not absorbed, they get reflected. Uh, so let me, let me show you a good picture here. So like here's your light coming in. So here's your granum, the stack of thylakoids. Remember, think of like a grand, a thousand grand. You got a big stack of poker chips, like a thousand grand. And then each individual poker chip, that's a thylakoid, which they, they don't um, show. But then uh, notice how the green light, that gets transmitted. That is not absorbed. Uh, that is what we then see with our eyes, and that's why plants will look green. Okay, bless you. And then most all other wavelengths of light are absorbed. Technically not all of them other than green. Some would get absorbed better than others. I'll show you a graph that shows you them, but um, just to kind of give you um, a basic example, uh, like idea. All right. There is something called a spectrophotometer. So a spectrophotometer, it is this, um, this fancy machine that basically helps you tell what wavelengths of light does um, uh, a sample absorb. So um, we'll use it for like photosynthesis, but you could use it for other samples too. Um, it's like a very common like chemistry lab kind of a machine. And um, so here's, here's the idea. So like how the machine would work is you'd have white light. Remember white light has all the, the wavelengths of light, all the different colors. Um, you're gonna refract it through a prism. So that prism is gonna break it up into the individual wavelengths. And then inside the machine, you'll have your chlorophyll solution. So we're trying to we're trying to experiment and see well what wavelengths of light would the chlorophyll solution absorb? What what wavelengths of light do we use for photosynthesis? And um, in the if you just isolate the green light, what you see is that the green light will go all the way through the solution, and there's this thing called a photoelectric tube. Basically, it's a tube that will then detect the absorbed light, or I'm sorry, the the not the absorbed light, but it'll detect the light that um, that gets transmitted that does not get absorbed by the solution. So that light goes through and what you see is um, 100%, about 100% of the light uh, got, got, gets transmitted and, um, uh, and goes to the, the, the photoelectric tube. Meaning, green light doesn't get absorbed by the chlorophyll for photosynthesis, as I said earlier. But then if you were to break it into say blue light, the blue light, notice how you get a very low reading on the galvanometer. Um, meaning you get a very low electric current. Very little um, amounts of light get through to the meter. There's a low transmittance, and that's because there's a high absorption from your chlorophyll solution, meaning that blue light is used very heavily in photosynthesis. Okay, so that's a basic way they could test to see, um, you know, kind of what wavelengths of light work in photosynthesis. Um, and then this is a graph just showing you um, your different pigment molecules and what wavelengths of light they work best at for photosynthesis. You don't need to memorize this, but um, it's more of just kind of an interesting thing. And you'll notice what I said earlier, that it's at the extremes of the visible light spectrum that photosynthesis is best at. So when you're in the purplish, bluish, you'll have, um, uh, especially like chlorophyll A, chlorophyll A is really, really good at doing photosynthesis here. And then chlorophyll A is interesting because it's, it's efficient here, but also it can then absorb um, the reddish light too. So it can absorb high energy and low energy light. 
You have something called chlorophyll B that just, they call it B. I don't know, I guess it's the second one that they discovered, but it, it just absorbs a slightly um, lower energy wavelength of light. Um, and then there's some called carotenoids. Carotenoids, um, they're more, they're good for like um, protection to the cell. Meaning they'll absorb some of these other wavelengths of light so that those wavelengths of light aren't like damaging the surrounding um, uh, cell. And that's more of their, their role in, in a photosynthesis. Not so much, they're not so much of a, a power plant or not so much of a, a solar panel as it is just like trying to catch strays. You know, just trying to catch some of those stray lights so it's not damaging the, the chloroplast. Okay, so keeping us moving. I uh, should have said everything here. Yeah, technically chlorophyll B and the carotenoids are accessory pigments. I'm not, I'm not gonna grill you, and nor could I imagine the AP exam grilling you on like, which of the following are accessory pigments, but just be aware that there is such a thing as accessory pigments. That it's not just all chlorophyll, that there are different kinds of pigments. Okay, and each one is specializes at a certain wavelength. And we call that, again, an absorption spectrum. It's the spectrum of light that gets absorbed. Okay. Um, <coughs> bless you. Uh, related to that is a, an action spectrum. It's, it's really the basic, same idea here, just um, bless you, a different way of showing it. So this would be like if you were to actually measure the, the rate of photosynthesis, if you were to measure the amount of oxygen produced, that's a, a waste product of photosynthesis. If you were to like say um, expose like um, a plant or something to like only like these like certain wavelengths of light and then kind of like what you did last class where you had like a probe measuring CO2, but this would be a probe that measures oxygen. See, okay, how much oxygen gets produced when that chlorophyll is exposed to whatever wavelength of light? How much, how does that change the reading of the oxygen levels? And what you see is what I said earlier, when you get to the extremes of those visible light spectrum, you'll get that the most um, oxygen being produced, right? And then as you get towards like the greenish parts of the light, you don't get as much oxygen being produced. Why? Why here will we not get as much oxygen produced? Luke? Right, those pigments, they don't absorb that wavelength of light. Good, just wanna make sure on the same page. All right, um, yeah, so everything I said there. And this is really another slide, kind of, this is all part of the same basic idea, but uh, that is, this is a very interesting experiment and, and appreciate the date, 1883. So this guy named Engelman, and um, he did this really clever experiment. He didn't have like these fancy spectrophotometers. He took filaments of algae. Algae um, can do photosynthesis. And what he noticed was if he exposed the, um, like if he, if he took a segment of that algae and exposed it to say purple light, he would get a bunch of aerobic bacteria clustering around that, uh, more aerobic bacteria clustering around the algae when he shined purple or reddish light than if he shined green light. Why would he use aerobic bacteria? What's the connection between aerobic bacteria and the algae and the wavelength of light? Somebody help me out with that. That's not super obvious. He has some algae and then he would, he would like shine light at it and then he would put aerobic, see where do the aerobic bacteria like focus their, their attention on? Do they focus on the part of the algae that has the purple light, the green light, or the red light? Why would aerobic bacteria be a good thing to see like where they congregate? What's the connection there? Keyword is aerobic. What does it mean to be aerobic bacteria? Need oxygen, right? Photosynthesis that the algae is doing, that's producing the oxygen. So that's a clever way that he was able to measure the amount of, he didn't have like an oxygen probe like you do. He had to do some kind of like indirect way to measure the amount of oxygen. So he focused on, well, what are things that use that oxygen? It's kind of, it's, I don't know, it's kind of, kind of a clever dude, right? Um, so that's how you could, he was able to tell, um, kind of like, basically it's his version of the action spectrum. Just, he didn't have an O2 probe, but he got the same data just using aerobic bacteria. Yeah. All right, um, should have said everything here. Yep. A lot of, you know, if you ever want to be a scientist, uh, which I am not, uh, you, gotta be, you gotta be clever. 
gotta be a little creative, you know? Being, um, a lot of people think like being a scientist, like it's like, oh, you just gotta be like straight math and science. But no, being like good, like artistic kind of person, being a good creative thinker, um, a lot a lot of the best experiments are just like people who just were really, really creative and just kind of came up with some different way of thinking of something. Anyways, um, here's your basic structure of a chlorophyll molecule. Notice that it's got a hydrocarbon tail, hydrocarbon, um, uh, carbon, and a bunch of hydrogens, right? So this is, um, Hydrophobic or hydrophilic? It's a hydrocarbon. Do you want to be attracted to water or hide from water? Attracted. It's actually hydrophobic. So um, think of fat. This is a this is a fatty tail. This is a this is like a fat. This is like one of your fatty acid tails. Okay. So why I bring that up is because this is going to be located in the membrane of your thylakoid. Because the the in the membrane, you have like the the um, the fatty acid tail of your membrane. So this portion of the chlorophyll molecule will be hanging out in the membrane of the thylakoid, and then the head of it that's going to be on the outer part of the membrane, where it's going to be more of the like outside of the membrane, going either in the stroma of the chloroplast or the inside of your thylakoid, where it's going to be water based. So this head is hydrophilic. So this is hydrophilic. It's like, in other words, it's a, it's sort of a similar structure to um, your uh, um, uh, your phospholipid, where you have a you have a hydrophilic head and then your hydrophobic tail. Now, what's interesting about this is you don't need to memorize this whole structure other than the hydrophilic hydrophobic. The difference between like chlorophyll A, chlorophyll B, those different pigment molecules, is just these these two functional groups. One has a CH three, one has a CHO. That's it. Changing, just subtly changing the structure of it just that little bit will change which wavelengths of light they're most effective at absorbing. And I think that's kind of, that's a wild thing with chemistry. Like little tiny changes can make a huge difference in like the whole structure of the molecule. All right, so moving forward. Uh, all right, so how do these things work? So this, whatever chlorophyll molecule you're using, whatever pigment molecule you're using, that light is going to hit the pigment and it's going to take an electron in that pigment and excite it. So if I draw your basic atom, you remember doing the flame lab in chemistry? So at the flame lab in chemistry, the idea would be like you took, um, I don't know, say I take like a lithium atom and if I, you put it underneath the Bunsen burner, you had the popsicle sticks put in the Bunsen burner you were to take an electron at a lower level, this would be like the ground state, that's the lower energy level, this electron would move to a higher energy level. We call that the excited state. And then at, like what goes up must come down, and so this electron will come back down to the lower energy level, but in order to go back down to the ground state, the lower energy level, it has to give off energy. It's gonna give off that energy in the form of light some sort of wavelength of that visible spectrum. So that's how you can identify the different elements. So some of the, in that, that, that flame lab, some of the, the popsicle sticks gave off like a purple color or like a red color, and that corresponded to the different um, elements that that solution was soaked in. So it's, that's, that's the basic idea. These chlorophyll molecules are absorbing the light energy and moving to their excited state, okay? Um, and that's what they're showing here. So if you took a chlorophyll molecule here, you shine a bunch of light on it in the form of photons. Those electrons go from a lower energy to a higher energy, or from a ground state to an excited state. And then when they have to come back down to their ground state, they have to give off that energy, and they'll give it off as some amount of heat. So if you had a beaker of chlorophyll molecules, this beaker would get hotter from those electrons releasing all their energy. And then also they're gonna give off light and that's why it's gonna fluoresce from that light given off from the electrons going from excited back to ground, okay? All right, um, now getting into how, the getting into the light reactions. So what is the connection to this in photosynthesis? So here's how it works. You have your sunlight, here comes the sunlight. Here's your thylakoid membrane, one single poker chip inside that thylakoid membrane Here's your, uh, your uh, hydrophobic region, the fatty acid tails, hydrophilic region. The photon is gonna hit um, uh, your, uh, we call it the light harvesting complexes. So you have 
two light harvesting complexes here and here. These light harvesting complexes will absorb, they have the pigment molecules that absorb the sunlight. Those electrons in each of the individual um, um, uh, pigment molecules absorb that energy. The electrons go from low energy to high energy, ground state to excited state, and they'll pass that energy from one pigment molecule to the next. All the way, it almost reminds you a little bit of the electron transport chain where they're passing the energy from one molecule to the next. And the purpose is you're gonna try and get all of that energy towards what we call the reaction center complex. So light harvesting complex is the solar panels. The light, rea the reaction center, that's really where we're trying to funnel that energy towards. Trying to funnel the energy from the light harvesting complex to the reaction center complex. In the reaction center complex, you have these special chlorophyll A molecules where their electrons will go from a low energy to a high energy, and then they'll pass that electron on um, to this primary electron acceptor. Okay, so the goal of all of this, so don't get lost in details, the goal of all of this, take the energy of the photon and transfer that energy to the electron acceptor. That's the goal. And we have all these intermediate molecules to pass that energy on. Okay, I'm gonna keep it moving. I'll, I'll go back to that story uh, again. And these next four slides are really just in words what I already said. Okay, make sure I said everything here. Here's a, a structure, like an x-ray crystallography structure of um, the photosystem. If you're curious, it's a thing. Cool. All right. So I showed you this slide when we did like 8.1. So let's kind of, we were really zoomed in. Let's, let's zoom out and understand like, what are we even doing here? So we take in the sunlight from photosynthesis. We have been talking about what I just showed you, those details, that's the light reaction. That's all 8.2. 8.3 will be the Calvin cycle. We'll get into that. That's, these are also called the dark reactions or the light independent reactions, because they don't need uh, light. The purpose of all this is you take the energy of sunlight and you're using the energy of sunlight to make ATP and NADPH. You use the energy stored in ATP and NADPH to then do what we call carbon fixation. Carbon fixation is basically a fancy way of saying you take a bunch of CO2 molecules and you attach them together to get a bigger carbon molecule, to get a bigger sugar molecule. Okay? That's the goal of all of this. Okay? Just kind of wanted to zoom out, let you see that fuller picture. All right. So here's, um, here's the full story. So this is all of the light reactions. So this is zooming in, in here on the light reactions. These are the light reactions. And I know it seems like a lot. It's, it's a lot simpler than it looks there. So let's just go through it step by step. And there's a lot of common themes. So here's your light coming in. That light, and, I, and I've already told you most of this story here. This light comes in, it's going to hit those pigment molecules. The pigment molecules are the green circles. The energy from the light is going to go from pigment molecule to pigment molecule to pigment molecule all throughout this little chain reaction. And the goal is to funnel the energy of the light to, this was chlorophyll A. This, is, this was your um, reaction center, what they have in light blue. The purple, everything in purple, that's your, um, the light harvesting complex. That's where you're absorbing the sunlight. So we're taking the energy of the sunlight, passing it from pigment molecule to pigment molecule, funneling all that energy to your reaction center. We're then going to take the electrons in P680. P680 is a fancy way of saying chlorophyll A. We take the energy from those electrons and we're going to send those electrons to your primary electron acceptor. Okay, I told you that story a couple slides ago. We then have to replace those electrons. 
right? You can't just keep removing electrons from something without replacing those electrons. So the question is, where do you get the electrons from? Water. This is why you have to water your plants. The water that you give to your plants is gonna be a source of electrons that you're gonna to use to replace the electrons on chlorophyll A, on P680, that you stripped away, okay? Basically, you're gonna take water and you're gonna break it apart into hydrogen ions and oxygen, and in the process of doing that, you free up some electrons that then go to P680 so that you can redo this process. This would be a redox reaction. This whole thing is a redox reaction, okay? Um, this oxygen is then what, is then what gets released from the plant. Okay, so then that electron that goes to the primary electron acceptor, it then is gonna get passed on down an electron transport chain. I'll go into the electron transport chain a little bit more detail um, in a couple slides, uh, just to remind you of how it works. But basically you pass the electron from here to here to here to here. You don't need to memorize these different molecules. It's just a bunch of um, redox reactions. This one's gonna, this gets reduced. It's then gonna get oxidized and reduce this molecule. This will get oxidized, passing electrons to the cytochrome complex. It gets reduced, accepting electrons and so on. And it's passing all of those electrons to another set of like, we call it photosystem one and photosystem two. Another set of basically the same reactions, the same process. Photosystem two, they call it photosystem two because it was discovered later. Discovered later, but ironically it happens first. Not a great name. Not a great name. Happens first, but it was discovered later. Um, so then we pass on the electrons, whole goal of this, to get the energy of these electrons, passing those electrons on down to photosystem one, and here you have P700. P700 is um, uh, another chlorophyll uh, uh, molecule. But it, it, the 700 is referring to the wavelength of light. So when they say P700 or P680, that's referring to the nanometer of light that is being absorbed. Okay? So then this is going to accept those electrons because what's going to happen is you have another set of light harvesting complexes, the other solar panels on photosystem one doing the same process that I talked about over here. Same process, meaning they're gonna pass electrons all the way to P700. The electrons from P700 are gonna go to its primary electron acceptor, but you have to replace the electrons. The electrons of P700 get replaced from the electron transport chain here. So this is gonna, how you replace the electrons for P700. We replace the electrons of P680 from the splitting of water, from water, okay? All right, now we're gonna pass these electrons to another electron acceptor, and we're going down another electron transport chain. So there's two electron transport chains in the light harvesting complex, or I'm sorry, in the light reactions. And then here, the ending acceptor is NADP+. Plus. This is then where we make the NADPH. I told you one of the products of the, light heart, of the light reactions is NADPH, that's where it's coming from. And I forgot to mention, in the first electron transport chain, you make ATP. So inputs, outputs is the big thing you need to understand here. Just like with cellular respiration, outputs of the light reactions are ATP, NADPH, and oxygen. And that's where they're coming from there, okay? That story is a lot. I think it'd be very helpful to like understand this now, forget it, and maybe like you could watch this video, read your book again to like hear that story again. Okay, it's an understandable story, but you just you gotta get it and then forget it, and then you keep doing that until it makes sense to you. Okay, I'm gonna keep it moving. Um, these slides here are just everything I said in words. Um. So yeah, PS2, that's, that, that happens first. It was, just the, it was discovered last, but it comes first. And it absorbs light at 680. That's why you had P680. Um, and then PS1, that's the second photosystem here. And it absorbs light best at um, uh, 700 nanometers. 
All right. Uh, so. Yeah, this is, this here is just describing what I was showing you with like the, um, like it's just describing how the electrons go from those pigment molecules and travel all the way down to end up making the NADPH. Okay, so it's just some words that I was explaining to you on um, uh, that picture slide. So I, I won't, I'll keep it moving and not like go through the whole story again. But if you want to read it, those steps, what I said in words, they're, they're here. Okay. All right, this picture here I think is, is very helpful. It's in a mechanical analogy of how this whole thing works. So if you're, if you're getting kind of lost in the details, this is basically what's happening. This guy with his hammer, this is the sun, and it's gonna shoot a photon, and it's gonna hit your pigment molecule. So here's your, this, um, what do you even call this? <laughs> uh, a fulcrum? A seesaw? This seesaw, I like seesaw. That's, that's good enough for my brain. This is your pigment molecule, right? This would be your chlorophylls absorbing that light, right? And then it's going to pass on those electrons. This would be in photosystem two. This would be where like, um, this would be your uh, P680, right? Accepting that electron. Well, actually, I'm sorry. P680 be here. And this would be your electron acceptor. And then the mill that makes ATP, that's, your, that's the first electron transport chain, ETC, right? Passing those electrons down the mill, using the energy of spinning that wheel, the electrons going down to make ATP. Then we're going to photosystem one, where this would be um, P700. No, and you need to know that. Like two six eighty one seven hundred. Think of it this way: What's the difference between um, seven hundred and six eighty? Twenty. Twenty. There you go. Um, okay, so P seven hundred takes that electron because remember you have other what they're oh here they are yeah so because this guy here's your other here's your other pigment molecules that are here accepting electrons. You have to replace those electrons that P700 is sending up to its electron acceptor. This is its electron acceptor. You have to replace those electrons using the electrons that come from the electron transport chain. What they're not showing here is that water is what's going to give its electrons to replace the electrons that are going up there. Okay. Um, all right. Those electrons then go up here, and then this is another electron transport chain that will then make the NADPH. I don't know if that made it easier, if it just made it more complicated, because it's like another thing to understand, but that's just maybe a different way of trying to think through this process. Okay? It's an understandable story. You just gotta put in, it's like, where's Waldo? Either you see Waldo or you don't. You gotta, either you're seeing this, it's making sense, or you don't, okay? It's, you can forget it after a little bit, but make sure you, you see it at least once. All right, um, okay, so I, I mentioned the electron transport chain, and um, it's worth talking about, well, how does the electron transport chain, and this making of ATP, or how does that compare to what we talked about in the mitochondria during cellular respiration? And it's very, very similar processes. Um, in other words, we're doing chemiosmosis. Chemiosmosis, chemi was referring to hydrogen ions, H plus. Osmosis is referring to that gradient. Um, that gradient where you have like more hydrogen ions up here and, and less down there. And that gives you a pushing, a, a, a gradient that pushes and you can use that to then make ATP. So it's a very, it's the same idea. And let me show you a picture of how it, how it worked again. So, because you got to understand the locations of this. Here, kind of orient what this picture is showing, because it's kind of a cool picture. On the left side, they're showing the locations of the electron transport chain in the mitochondria versus the location of the electron transport chain in the chloroplast. 
and the mitochondria, you add your electron transport chain, the electrons went down the chain, and you use the energy of you passing those electrons down the chain to pump those hydrogen ions to uh, the intermembrane space. And notice the color coordination here. This has a higher concentration of H+. Plus. This has a lower concentration of H+. Plus. And that is because you're pumping the hydrogen ions from the matrix of the mitochondria to the intermembrane space. For the chloroplast, what that was related to is you had the stroma of the chloroplast. Stroma of the chloroplast is this area outside of here. It's all of the space inside the chloroplast. That's where we're going to take the hydrogen ions and then we're going to pump them into the thylakoid space. The thylakoid space is this stuff inside here. It's all of the, the space inside each individual thylakoid. Okay? And then whether it's the mitochondria or the chloroplast, both of them, it's the same idea where you use the energy of the hydrogen ions going from higher concentration to lower concentration. It's like a windmill. The hydrogen ions are like the wind where they move through the uh, turbine that is ATP synthase, this protein here. Remember, the only way for these hydrogen ions to get back inside um, uh, the stroma or the matrix is through ATP synthase. So it's, it, the energy of them going through this protein is going to spin um, a catalytic knob that attaches um, inorganic phosphate to ADP, thus making ATP. Okay? So that's, that should be a review for you of, of how the electron transport chain works. Same, same thing. So in other words, every time you see electron transport chain, like when you see the electron transport chain here, like when they say electron transport chain and ATP, that's what this slide is saying. That's the same process that you saw during cellular respiration. Okay? Just some just different locations and some different molecules. Is there questions about that? I know it's a lot. I, I, I'm sorry. It just is what it is. Um, all right. Um, yeah, so this should just be words I already I said on the last slide. Um, yeah, purpose of the light reactions, you're making ATP, so that's an output, that's an output, make an ADPH, and then to, to replace your electrons, you replace your electrons um, using water. And when you do that, you're going to release oxygen as a byproduct. Then you use the energy of ATP and ADPH to then do the Calvin cycle where you then make the sugar. Okay. I think this is the final picture to go over. And this, this is hopefully tying it all together to you. So as much as possible, and this might be something to get in full screen on your laptop, try to stick with me here. This is just nothing new here. This is just bringing it all together. Let me get, let me get a sip of water for this. All right, light comes in and light is gonna hit photo system two. It's gonna hit the, um, the light harvesting complexes. That's the purple on either side of the light reaction center. So these electrons, the light's gonna take, the energy of the light's gonna go from pigment molecule to pigment molecule. And then those, uh, that energy is then going to, going to excite chlorophyll A here. This is um, P680. That is P680 there. Those electrons will then get passed to an electron acceptor. We then have to replace those electrons from water. The replacement electrons come from water to replace the electrons of P680. And then in the process, you, you uh, produce oxygen that gets released. You also, and I didn't emphasize this at first, you also make the hydrogen ions. These hydrogen ions collect in the thylakoid space. So you get a high concentration of H pluses. Those will then be used to power the ATP synthase to then make your ATP, right? These hydrogen ions that you're making here whenever you're um, replacing the electrons, but also here, this is your electron transport chain. Here, you also get electrons being pumped here. Those hydrogen ions will then go through the ATP synthase to make your ATP, okay? All right, and then um, 
these electrons here, they're going down that electron transport chain. Okay, so that's what you're seeing here. Here's your electron transport chain. And they get sent to photosystem one. The purpose of these electrons in photosystem, uh, of these electrons here, is they're gonna replace the electrons that are being removed from P700. Because remember in photosystem one, remember don't be confused by the names, photosystem one is second, discovered first but second in the chain here. These electrons, you have the same um, process hap that happened here, happening here, where light is, is um, going from pigment molecule to pigment molecule, and then those, the energy from that light is uh, sending electrons from P700 to your electron acceptor right here, just like we did here. We have to replace those electrons, but you don't replace those electrons from water like we did in photosystem two. You replace the electrons from the electron transport chain. Okay? That's the purpose of the electron transport chain is to replace those electrons. Its purpose also is to send hydrogen ions into the thylakoid space to get that hydrogen ion gradient that you can use to make ATP. Okay? Um, and then at the end of then this electron that goes from P700 to the electron acceptor goes down another, here's your second electron transport chain. But this elect, the second electron transport chain doesn't make ATP, it's making NADPH. Then ATP and NADPH, they are then sent to the Calvin cycle, and the energy of these molecules are used in the Calvin cycle to make your sugar. And we'll talk about that um, after the break. I think that's about the last slide. Um, I know it's a lot. I, plants are complicated, everybody. You just thought plants are a bunch of idiots sitting there doing photosynthesis, but really they're pretty complicated. There's a lot going on with plants. They might take over the world, like that movie where they like start killing people and stuff. Whoa. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not rooting for it, I'm just saying it could happen, all right? So just give, me, just give me one second, just let me say that, let me zoom out for you. Don't get lost, I know it's easy to get lost in all these details, the purpose of all that here, the light reactions, that's what this slide was. Purpose was take energy from light, input is light, input is water. Here are your inputs, right here. Inputs, light, and water. We're doing it in the thylakoid, that's your location. Your outputs then, outputs are oxygen, ATP, and NADPH. Oh, other inputs. NADP plus and ADP because you have to use those to make ATP and NADPH. The energy from ATP and NADPH go to the Calvin cycle, also called the dark reactions, light independent reactions, and you use that energy to then attach a bunch of CO2 molecule that's called carbon fixation to then make your sugar. Okay? Alright, um, so let me get us 